What happens when some of the most formidable alien foes face each other off? Add humans and an existential goo in the mix, and you can expect some drama and a lot of super horrific yet exciting science fiction to come into play. Let's dive into the 17 issues of the Alien vs Predator saga and experience the gore and confusion that follows. Aliens, Fire and Stone – Narrow Escapes The first issue begins with the gory glimpses of the infamous xenomorphs attacking and brutally killing the colony members of the colony on the moon LV-426, aka Asheron, one of the three known moons of the Kalpamos planetoid in the Zeta II reticuli system. Derek Russell, the person in charge of terraforming LV-426, is leading his crew and others away from the monstrous xenomorphs, realizing that the time to abandon the forsaken moon has come. We see them make their way amid the terror of unfortunate people being ripped apart limb to limb by the xenomorphs. Amidst the frantic struggle to escape the xenomorphs, Russell runs into Genevieve Dion, the greenhouse supervisor and a teacher for the children of the colonists on the moon. Their only plan was getting off this forsaken moon. Archeron wasn't equipped for such an ambush. Their only hope was Onega, a cargo and drill ship used to drill and carry ore to the low orbit. Nolan Kale, a company wildcatter, was readying the Onega for their escape. The group was heading towards the Onega, only to find the Xenomorphs already there, but completely distracted by the battle with Kale's men. Everyone loaded the ship, and a last check was called for by Russell, who asked Kale if his men could close off the cargo hold's hatches before taking off. Kale checked and noted that maybe his men closed off the cargo hold. Just then, he finds the Xenomorphs approaching their ship. Russell suggested that the cargo containers could be detached if they weren't closed, indicating that Kale would have to sacrifice his life and stay behind. Kale told Russell to take off, and they escaped the aliens. Russell had his apprehensions about the Onega making its way to another moon in a safe fashion. Ramona had no previous experience maneuvering a drill ship, but she wasn't going to let that stop her from giving a group a chance at survival. With barely enough fuel left in the tank, they crash land on the surface of the closest moon they could find. All was well. Russell was hoping they'd left the Xenomorphs behind. On the surface of this moon, Russell was wondering how they even survived because, according to what he'd heard, this particular moon wasn't supposed to have a breathable atmosphere. A quick check of the passengers on board revealed that everyone was merely bruised except for Kale, who seemed to have concussed according to Dion and was unconscious. While Dion tended to Kale, Russell asked for the supplies from the cargo hold. Just as they began to open the cargo hold, Kale came to and screamed for them to stop, and as if on cue, the Xenomorphs tore through the cargo hold and began to once again ravage the crowd. Russell was a peculiar man to have taken a moment to take in the supposed beauty that the Xenomorphs ravaging brought. Running towards higher ground, the group reached the woods. The forest that they'd entered allowed them to get away from the Xenomorphs, who had found themselves busy with the unfortunate people who didn't manage to escape them. Not far into the woods, Russell saw a vast clearing that wasn't visible before and immediately planned to fortify it. Kale, being the simpleton that he is, was now too tired to strategize and got annoyed at Russell for already making up plans. Russell reminded Dion that they wouldn't be going anywhere until they had a solid plan to get the transceiver off the Onega. Dion wasn't too happy with or sure of this thought. It meant having to go back to what they just escaped. Russell told them they'd find a way, but inside him were foreboding thoughts. Things were terrible now, but he had a feeling they were about to get worse much more than they'd naively imagined. The Camp, the Debaters, and the Scientist Russell and his crew were somehow surviving on LV-223, one of the three known moons of the Kalpamos planet. Russell notices an orb that's been making the rounds presumably around the moon. Over the course of a few days, the orb contained his interests and eventually he managed to get his hands on it. He inspected it, and to his surprise, it was the remnant from one of the older survey missions. This brought him to the thought that maybe they weren't the first crew to have landed here. His suspicions came to a conclusion when his tinkering with the orb led to it playing a recording. The recording mentioned Prometheus, which confirmed Russell's suspicions. While Russell was engrossed in his own side quest on LV-223, the rest of the makeshift camp had other concerns. Kale and Dion were at constant loggerheads in trying to prove whose opinion about the Xenomorphs was more accurate. Kale believed that it was time to pull their socks up and face the Xenomorphs and take them out before they preyed on the camp again. Dion was more interested in rallying the group to fortify the camp borders and solidify their barricades to keep them out, rightfully pointing out that taking on the alien freaks would be nothing short of suicide. This argument had been ongoing since they escaped the Xenomorphs on LV-223, and Russell didn't wish to pay heed to either opinion, as to him they meant nothing in front of the quest that he was on, the quest that could answer his questions. It wasn't as though the Xenomorphs were laying low like the humans. There were attacks that followed the first one, and every time they happened, the same argument was given the fuel it needed. The day Russell felt he had enough information to tell the camp was when he called them all and announced his deductions. He sounded like a madman to the people listening to him. He talks about how the planet LV-223 was indeed barren and lifeless, 
but when terraforming had begun on the planet, it gave rise to what they see today. His enthusiastic announcement about an otherwise huge scientific breakthrough was met with cold indifference. With time, they got better at gauging the terrain, making them better at evading their predators. Russell's appetite to find out more had only grown. He felt as though there was more than what meets the eye. He kept going about his side quests, until one day he stumbled on something that blew his mind. He found a crashed ship. Inside it, a terraforming array, a bridge, and a surprise guest, restfully asleep inside an active hypersleep chamber. He decided to keep it all a secret and collected a few things from the ship to a cave he'd found nearby. He decided to keep a journal for himself using the rover to record his findings. Reminiscing about the times when their lives were more than survival, Kale, Louise, and another man were fishing at the lake in an attempt to get some fresh catch for the camp's dinner. Unfortunately, though, they were soon to become fresh catch themselves. A xenomorph waited for its meal of the day. Dropping onto the raft, the xenomorph began grappling for its prey, which it found in Louise. The xenomorph took him into the depths of the lake, allowing Kale and the other man their escape. Laser at the camp, ensued with rage-filled debate, Russell, still in his own world, kept himself uninvolved in the bickering around him. The night had fallen around them, the seemingly serene lake was throbbing under its surface, and an unexpected mutation had taken its form, a form that was about to be unleashed onto the camp the debaters, and the science enthusiast. A price to pay. It had been approximately three months on LV-223. The camp was losing people to the attacks of the xenomorphs. They were scavenging to find anything remotely edible. Ramona and a few others were out searching for food while they discussed the black goo and how it turned everything that it touched weird, when suddenly they were met with a half-Louise, half-xenomorph mutation. It sprang onto one of the crewmen, giving Ramona and the other man a chance to escape it. Approaching the camp, Ramona tore her lungs out, screaming for help. In a state of frenzy, she led the mutant xenomorph right to the camp. Among the scrambling crowds, Dion shouted orders, trying to bring everyone together to defeat the mutant. Kale, on the other hand, dove into action, and Russell, in typical scientist fashion, stood safely at a distance, observing the mutant xenomorph and its mutation. Kale may have been brutish, but this is exactly what saved the camp on this day when he drove a spear through the mutant, instantly killing the xenohuman and his buddy, Louise. Grappling with the reality of just having murdered his buddy turned mutant, Kale started breaking down in profuse apologies, revealing that it was all his fault. Thinking that he was flogging himself about having killed his friend, Dion went to comfort him, but Kale burst out admitting that he'd seen the xenomorphs enter the cargo hold on LV-426 prior to taking off. His fear of being abandoned, he'd kept his mouth shut and told no one about it. Dion swung at Kale, hitting him square in the jaw and bringing him down to his force. Two men from the camp held her back. She was furious at the sheer stupidity that led to so many dying, that turned what could have been a safe haven into a cat-and-mouse game. Kale proposed making the trip back to the Onega to get the transceiver and supplies. Dion wasn't too pleased and reminded Kale that the plan was idiotic and anyone willing to go with him was a fool. Our observant scientist made his way back into his cave. The cave became a place that indulged his questions with more questions, and his rover, who was now a friend, was always there to listen to him. Russell kept contemplating various possibilities about how LV-223 had turned out to be this way, how the black goo had transformed the entire planet, accelerating the growth of everything it touched, and making centuries' worth of evolutionary work come to completion in mere decades. The crew that set off towards the Onega had made it to its doors alive. They opened the door and took a few steps in, only to find a xenomorph hive along with their mother alien and her defenders. The defenders were quick to attack the humans. Kale told the men to hold the xenomorphs off while he went to get the transceiver. The men fought well enough to let Kale exit the Onega, but not well enough to have survived the fight. Unfortunately for Kale, just when he thought he'd escaped, a xenomorph grabbed him, making the transceiver fall to the ground. The reclusive scientist Russell was back in his cave of comfort this time conducting studies with the black goo and how it had been accelerating the growth of all the life forms it came in contact with, he wondered what its impact would be on a human if a human were to be exposed to it in more than trace amounts. It was the last day of October 2179. Dion had sat near the barricades awaiting the arrival of Kale and the others that went with him. In her bed, Dion closed her eyes. In her bed. She heard someone call out her name and was woken up. Moving aside the sheet that made up the door to her cabin, she called out for Kale. A zombified Kale lunged in her direction, and Dion's arm was now in his grip. The xenomorphs from the Onega had made it back to the camp using Zombie Kale as their GPS to the campgrounds. Zombie Kale, on the other hand, was dragging an unconscious Dion while chanting the word sorry, slowly losing a hold over his own mind. Up in his cave, Russell was unbothered by the screams coming from down below, worried only about whether or not the xenomorphs would find his hideout, asking his inanimate friend if the rover accidentally revealed the location of the cave to the xenomorphs, because he certainly hadn't. The Quest of a Madman 
Russell, along with his pet rover, approached the wreckage of another spaceship. It would have been safe to assume that Russell's mental health was deteriorating rapidly. He didn't care about the survivors of the attack that took place on the camp just a few days ago. He was, in fact, planning to go out and explore beyond the jungle. What else do you really expect out of a man who was cooped up in a cave, with his only companion being an inanimate rover he calls his pet? While searching for untainted fruit in the landscape of the jungle, he comes across a diary that was left behind by one of his crewmates and decides to read it. He turns his attention to a page when he hears a faint scree. Looking up was a xenomorph on a branch right above him. He recognizes the xenomorph as Kale and is surprised when the xenohuman extends his arm out towards Russell with a loud screech. Holding on to the book, he runs for his life and climbs up the mountain. He looks back to find that the xenohuman didn't follow him. Instead, he was surrounded by other xenomorphs. It's four versus one. Xenohuman Kale slashes the xenomorph closest to him, making the other three run away from him. Still holding on to dear life, Russell observes this occurrence and is perplexed. Later that evening in his cave, Russell brainstormed the possibilities of how Kale survived while Louis fused with the xenomorph but was entirely under its control. He then began deducing that maybe the mountain itself was growing and, in his delirious mind, contemplated the possibility of it protecting him. He kept making trips to the abandoned ship, hoping to get answers to his many questions from the quaint occupants of the hypersleep chambers. His frustrations got the better of him, making him scream and thunk the locked chamber with his fists, hoping against hope for a response. Russell was spiraling. Strapped onto his makeshift table was a mutant cat. Talking to himself and his rover, he was trying to figure out how the black goo was a boon to someone like Kale and a death sentence to Louise. What was the difference? He knew that direct contact with the goo meant certain death, but maybe trace amounts would not prove fatal. Russell woke up with an unbearable headache. He asked his rover for help and tinkered with it to make the survey and scanning orb scanning for answers to this emergent issue. The rover showed him a scan of his brain. He thought maybe those were tumors. The rover began beeping, getting a human signal from under the mountain, making Russell fear that the hill might eat him up. A few days later, he went to the graveyard, a graveyard that he probably built after the carnage at the camp. He visits the grave of his friend, Genevieve Dion. From behind a nearby tree, Xenohuman Kale appears, and this time, Russell does not run. Kale slashes out at Russell, making him fall. Grabbing the cross from a nearby grave, he hits the creature, making it claw at Russell, a bleeding claw mark across his chest. The Xenohuman approaches Russell once again, and against his wishes, Russell kills the creature. A platoon of Xenomorphs came in his direction. He bolts, hoping his feet can carry him fast enough to escape them, knowing that the possibility of outrunning the Xenomorphs is bleak. Even in this state, he was thinking about the black goo and tripped and fell. The Xenomorphs nearing him, he calls out for his rover, or maybe the mountain, to come to his aid. He notices that he fell right in front of a puddle of black goo. His mind goes to frantic places in a bid to avoid being torn to pieces. This brings us to the end of the four-issue series, Aliens, Fire and Stone. What happened to Russell? Why did the spaceship that crash-landed on LV-223 have video recordings of the last mission? Who was the occupant of the hypersleep chamber? And lastly, what happened to the first crew that came to LV-223? Keep watching this video as we explore the next comic series, Prometheus, Fire and Stone. Prometheus, Fire and Stone, Captain Angela's Secret. The first issue of this four-part series begins with a flashback from the year 2090. A survey probe reaches LV-223, one of the three moons of the planetoid Kalpamos in the Zeta-2 reticuli system. For the next three days, the probe travels the vast expanse of the barren moon, gathering and transmitting data about the ambient climate, features, and weather-related information. However, exactly three days after arriving on the moon, the probe logs a collision warning, only to be destroyed by an engineer's foot walking towards the horizon. Fast forward to the present day, almost two centuries later. Clara Atkinson is aboard the command ship Helios, one of the three ships docked to an engine core vehicle called Grayon. The name derived from Medusa's son, who had three heads and one body. She expresses her excitement about this mission and about creating history. They're just two days away from reaching the forsaken moon LV-223. Grayon has two other mission-specific ships docked to it, Cadmos, a salvage vehicle, and Perseus, a patrol ship. Clara is introduced as the film girl to the crew, introducing Angela Foster as the captain of the salvage expedition for a US CSS vessel that had crashed with a high-value payload on the desert moon. Moving on, Clara introduces Dr. James Waddell as the expedition's doctor and a person of her particular interest. Next, she introduces Francis Lane, the expedition's astrobiologist, the man in charge of studying all forms of alien life and researching them. His android partner, Eldon, is introduced, who is one of the several androids who maintain them in these deep space voyages, and Galgo Helder, the chief security officer for the expedition. The entire crew is sitting together watching the final outcome of the video Clara was working on. 
documenting the salvage expedition on Captain Angela's orders. Cutting the cheeky banter and Galgo story short, Captain Angela politely reminds the crew that the vessel is just three hours from landing on the deserted moon. In another part of the vessel, the captain is in her chambers recording a brief video log where it's revealed for the first time that this mission is not a simple low-risk, high-value salvage mission as it had been painted for the rest of the crew. This mission has been the result of her research for years, which led her to the same moon where Peter Whelan sent the probe to. Her real motive is to recover data and seek the answers Wayland was once personally invested in finding the true origin of our species. Following the recording, the captain and the other crew members get into their respective ships and depart for the surface of LV-223. While approaching their designated landing spot, another one of Galgo's banter is interrupted only because the supposedly barren desert moon they were supposed to land on presents them with a lush jungle containing a variety of fauna somewhat physiologically similar to species found on Earth. While traversing through the jungle, Angela and Galgo discover a vast stretch of clearing with several dead and mutilated corpses of local fauna. Meanwhile, Francis and Eldon come across a pool of the infamous black goo and gather samples after Francis' scans reveal it to contain every known and unknown genetic makeup. Francis comments that the goo in this place is pure scientific chaos. Galgo abruptly interrupts and asks the science team to stay together, warning them of dangerous predatory creatures that lurk in the jungle, especially after his crew discovered the killing field in another part of the jungle nearby. As the entire crew makes its way through the jungle, Takahashi gets an extremely high reading of metal again. At this point, Captain Angela looks around to find a metallic shrine. She quickly discovers it to be some kind of artificial structure. She and the others on her orders quickly clear out enough of the flora only to discover the derelict ruins of Hadley's Hope, the ship that was supposed to be stationed on the neighboring moon LV-426. Captain Angela quickly gets to work on attempting to gain access to the ship via a door to figure out why this ship crashed here and why a deserted moon had a lush jungle contrary to all the data they had. Behind the closed doors though, unbeknownst to Captain Angela and the rest of her unsuspecting crew, are several xenomorphs seemingly trapped and waiting to be released. A friend's betrayal. Captain Angela unlocks the door and the expedition team walks into the ship, on suspicion of what lies in there waiting for them. The team is ambushed from all directions by xenomorphs, who've clearly outnumbered the poor crewmen. Some members are caught by the facehuggers, while Galgo and his team frantically pave a path to escape Hadley's hope. Captain Foster calls for the third ship, Cadmos, in the hopes of getting rescued. The crew on Cadmos receive their signals and make their way to the helpless crewmen. Amidst all the commotion, Francis and Eldon have been separated from the rest of the team. While Cadmos makes its way toward the team for evacuation, they're faced with the challenge of finding a landing spot close to the team. Some members almost fall to their deaths into the deep lake, infested with mutated shark-like creatures that lunge toward them. Galgo and his team manage to save them, and they're successfully evacuated and aboard the Cadmus. A few days later, the surviving crew gathers in their lead ship, Helios. Captain Angela informs the team that two of their mates, Steinberg and Woodbell, might not make it. The facehuggers, being true to their nature, had engulfed them. She also shares that Francis and Eldon have split from the rest of the group while they're making their escape. Eventually, Captain Angela, ridden with guilt, shares her real purpose. The captain reveals that the real motive for this mission was to continue and conclude Whalen's research about the engineers. Whalen strongly believed that the engineers were the original creators of humanity, and they were the ones who created the black goo to seed the entire universe. This revelation angers and upsets the crew, and her secret has led to the deaths of her crewmates and two more battling to stay alive. In another part of the moon, the estranged Francis and Eldon stumble across a cave with clear signs of past habitation. They discover valuable information and notes belonging to a Derek Russell. Francis was actively communicating with Captain Angela, relaying all their observations in the cave. Russell had extensively studied the black goo he found. Francis was elated that his deductions about the black goo were exactly what he had in mind, a universe-changing accelerant. They found a probe on which Russell logged his daily activities and left it behind for future generations to find. Francis reveals that the data from the probe pointed to the origin of the black goo and the alien ship, a crashed engineer ship that had caused the black goo to seep into the barren moon and terraform it in just a matter of two centuries. He emphasized that the strangely mutated flora and fauna that they saw earlier was solely the black goo's doing. Back at Helios, Captain Angela had decided it was time to bring Eldon and Francis back to safety and teamed up with her crew to find them. The rest of the crew that didn't go along had a different fate waiting for them in their seemingly safe ship. They're ambushed once again, barely managing to barricade themselves inside the ship. They narrowly escape with their lives. Meanwhile, in the cave, Francis and Eldon discuss their discovery and they reach a conclusion that the events occurring on LV-223 and their current situation all point towards the accelerant. Francis asks Eldon for a favor, given their recent discovery. 
On the way to rescue their science team, Captain Angela, Galgo, and the others stumble upon the wreckage of the alien ship. They begin exploring the wreck, where Galgo finds an interesting weapon of alien origin and decides to use it for their advantage. While they explore the ship, they seem to forget what they actually came there to do. Francis takes a syringe full of the black goo, coaxing the android to allow him to inject only a drop of it into his blood to study its effects. Eldon is extremely apprehensive but allows for a drop. However, Francis had other plans and his mind wanted more than he could have asked from Eldon. And in a split second, he emptied the entire syringe into Eldon's arm. Immediately, Eldon's body reacts violently, sliding into a frenzied state, his mind spiraling into a chaotic confusion with a looming feeling of betrayal taking him over. Stuck between a rock and a hard place. Captain Angela is radioing in to figure out if Eldon and Francis are safe, but Francis sprints across the barren land outside the cave in an attempt to get away from his friend. Eldon tackles Francis, and menacingly asks him if he remembers his friend introducing himself as Eldon. This version of Eldon was not the same, as the black goo had mutated and taken hold of Eldon, somewhat like what had happened to Kale in the previous series, Aliens Fire and Stone. Francis gets up and apologizes while also trying to get away from Eldon. The rescue team is now looking for both of them, Captain Angela making sure her team stays together and double-checks their surroundings. While Golgo starts off with his usual but unnecessary banter, a crew member asks the captain if they should have carried the canister along with them. Angela reminds them that this is a search-and-grab mission and they don't need to engage with any alien life. Inside Helios, the crew is having lunch. A xenomorph decides lunchtime is over and strikes the window from the outside. They immediately tell the captain about it. Captain Angela asks for a complete lockdown of the ship and orders them to take the ship off the ground to get away from the xenomorphs. While the crew in the jungle makes their way to Helios, Golgo gets jumped by a mutated monkey but escapes with only a scar on his face. Helios is under a red alert, which panics his crew while the ship starts to lock down. The crew in the jungle suddenly tracks a human life form on their radar, and just before they can react to it, out from the bushes emerges Francis. Angela asks him where Eldon is, which leads to Francis' confession, and being the captain of the ship, she announces charges against him. She asked for an update on Helios, and the details of that update seemed hopeful as the ship had been locked down in time. Angela suggests distracting the aliens away from their landing point while the jungle crew is on their way to the ship. At the end of the ship, they find hordes of xenomorphs, actively trying to make their way into the ship's hull. Golgo gets called to bring his ship Perseus to distract the aliens, asking him to not fire at the aliens, sending Francis the prisoner along with them. Suddenly, Golgo hears a rustling behind him, making sure he's not seen. He manages to see an engineer walking past him. He watches as the engineer kills the xenomorphs in his way. Mutant Eldon makes his way toward the door of the Helios, asking the aliens around him if they needed help. He then easily opens and enters the sealed doors of Helios, letting the xenomorphs into the ship. Golgo and his crew, on the other hand, had decided to dismiss Angela's orders and destroy the aliens. Angela tries to talk some sense into Galgo, but being the rebel that he is, he decides to leave them to their fate and takes the Perseus back into orbit. Helios has been compromised. Eldon had entered the ship, and the crew that was barricaded inside the ship was frantic. They had no idea of what was happening to them. One by one, the Xenomorphs took out crew members inside the ship while also trying to ravage the crew in the jungle. The trapped crew finds the buggies inside the ship and decides to abandon Helios on Angela's orders. The Xenomorphs chase the buggies while following them to the alien vessel where the jungle crew is waiting. Both teams meet and get into the alien ship, the Xenomorphs finally backing off at the sight of the ship. The crew is now inside the alien ship and they hear gunshots. Galgo has returned and killed all of the Cadmos crewmen in an attempt to cover up the fact that he abandoned them. Angela and her crew find out about Galgo's doing via the radio. While the crew inside the alien ship explore their surroundings, they find specimens and weird creatures trapped in some sort of incubation cells in a place that looked like a lab, leading them to conclude that it was the engineers that terraformed LV-223. Waddell informs Captain Angela that they had a serious problem incoming. They were unidentified blips on their radars that doubled every second. He was sure that the ship was breached and the aliens had entered. Gathering her crew and asking them to stay close, they run to find a secure place. They're fighting for their lives while contemplating if the Xenomorphs could see them in the dark. Clara, not realizing the situation, was so awestruck, he forgets to leave with the crew and was left behind in the lab. Waddell leaves to get Clara, and just as they're about to leave, they find themselves surrounded by Xenomorphs. The rest of the crew that's trying to escape in the dark are now surrounded by Xenomorphs themselves. Clara and Waddell are trying to figure out where the rest of the crew is, to which Clara sobs and says she's lost them, and all she saw were the Xenomorphs. Just as they're about to be devoured by the Xenomorphs, the engineer from the jungle walks in with his alien gun and blasts in the direction of the Xenomorphs, turning them into vapor. The engineer continues killing the Xenomorphs and is met with Clara and Waddell. He doesn't care for their niceties and vaporizes them too, without any hassle. The scene changes. Eldon is looking at a Wayland yutani poster, 
Reading the word friend triggers him, and he aggressively rips it off the wall. Turning to the xenomorph surrounding him, he tells them that they're now his friends. Eldon takes control of the Helios and rides out with his new friends in search of his betrayer, making his way toward the Greyon. Captain Angela, Jill, and Chris had somehow managed to escape and were on their way to the cave from which Francis had sent his last location. On reaching the cave, they find that only the three of them had made it out alive. The information is too much to bear, urges Angela to reassure the other two that they'd wait here in the safety of the cave until things calm down, and in the meanwhile, they should try and make the cave their home. Alien vs Predator, Fire and Stone Two aliens and a man Meanwhile, in a neighboring star system, Predators are participating in an ancient and primal tradition, but their endless search for deadlier prey is going to lead them somewhere unexpected. On a lush planet, the Predators have finally caught up to their latest prey and finished them off. One of them detects a nearby spaceship in their systems. It's the Geryon Armada. Incorporating the Geryon, Cadmus, and Perseus vessels en route from the Zeta II Reticuli system. They've just finished with their FTL crosscheck. Golgo is asked what's next, to which he replies that they'll keep heading in the same direction for the next two years, climb into their cryotubes, and try to sleep off the nightmare they experienced. Higgins meant something else by his question, but Galgo chose to ignore his inference. Soon enough, he's told they're going to bring the Cadmos and the Geryon with them as well, stating Wayland will be thrilled to get them back. Higgins says he's done talking about Angela and the rest of the crew. He wants to talk about the alien weapon, which is worth enough coin for them to retire in style. Golgo says they're going to decide on their version of the truth about what happened on LV-223, and say that, when asked, they're good to make the jump. The Cadmos is in proper shape. It's sickbay with about half a dozen injured. The fleet is minutes away from hitting FTL once they're outside of the shipping lane. Galgo tells them he needs a few more minutes alone with their cargo. He leaves them in their cryotubes and tells them to sleep tight. Soon after, he's looking for Francis. He finds Francis, who says his imprisonment in the cargo hold is inhumane. Golgo tells him he's taking him out since they're going FTL, he's being sent to a cryotube. Francis pleads innocence to Golgo, who says he'll decide what will happen to Francis once they land. Golgo asks Francis why he let Eldon loose and puts the alien rifle to his head. Francis asks Golgo to calm down and pleads for some sort of arrangement. They hear a noise and soon find Eldon speaking to Francis via the intercom on this ship. Eldon says he's right behind them. A bloodthirsty Eldon wants to hurt Francis but needs him alive. The ship comes to a halt and Francis asks Eldon what he did. Eldon says he's in the command ship, Helios. Helios controls everything as long as they're attached to the Geryon. Eldon could shut off their oxygen. He could open all the hatches and crush them like a can if he wanted to. Eldon makes it clear the thing he wants is Francis, and commands him to bring Francis to the Helios. He gives them time to say their goodbyes. Galgo immediately hits Francis and tells him he's got a date with Karma. Francis tries to negotiate with Galgo, but to no avail. Galgo has no option but to follow Eldon's order in order to bring his ship and crew back safely. Eldon is coming to terms with his newfound thoughts, finding all the pain odd. Francis continues his frail attempt at trying to convince Galgo that they can fight him and be free. Galgo simply tells him that he's done with all the fighting and just wants to go home. On the other side, they hear the Cadmos hatch go off. Francis is only sorry he couldn't find the cure he was after, that he couldn't bring the accelerant home and make it work. He's greeted by Eldon on the other side, who tells him to approach the door and tells Galgo to keep his distance since they both know how dangerous the other is. Eldon and Francis have a conversation on the opposite sides of the hatch. Just then, they hear the breach alarm, and Eldon thinks it's another one of their tricks. He opens the hatch completely and lets himself and his xenomorphs in. Galgo opens fire immediately and kills a xenomorph. Seeing the fear creep up on Galgo and Francis specifically makes Eldon happy. In the sick bay of the Cadmus, the crew hears the breach alarm and wonder if something got inside. What they don't know is that the Predators have been watching them closely while being completely invisible, invisibility being one of their powers. The crew believes Galgo will take care of the breach and they should secure the room. Meanwhile, Galgo is on the run from Xenomorphs and tells a construct to alert the troops and target all non-humans. Eldon observes that everything is growing faster. While he thought he was becoming human, he also knows that the black goo is something different, something ancient. Galgo is ready to shoot Francis, who's begging him to work together and get back to Percy's. Eldon, on the other hand, begins his search for his escaped victims by cutting off the lights. The scene shifts to a fight between the Predators and the Constructs while Eldon is in a monologue with Francis. Eldon says he warned Francis, and now everyone is paying for his sins. While continuing his thoughts, he marveled at how the real creators created works of art and that he was turning into something unknown, terming himself as a creation of a shoddy creator. The crew back at Percy's barricades their door, but the xenomorphs break in and annihilate the crew. 
The Predators easily destroy the constructs. Eldon is scrolling through the cameras on Helios, looking for Francis. The Predators notice Eldon on the move. Golgo is holding Francis hostage when they hear the clicking of a Predator nearby. Soon, they're ambushed by one, hurting Francis and knocking Golgo to the ground. Francis runs away, and Golgo turns around and kills the Predator. Golgo makes a run for it, chased by a Xenomorph. He somehow makes it and seals the door, shutting the Xenomorph out. Eldon says a part of him wants Francis to escape, only to die of his disease. He finds it funny how much death came from him helping Francis live. Francis keeps himself hidden from the Predators, Eldon and the Xenomorphs. Golgo undocks the Perseus from the Geryon and takes off. Eldon, Galdo and Francis are aboard the Perseus that are seemingly heading back home. While Eldon's talking to Francis, he notices the Cloak Predators and casually says hello to them. Eldon gets a hole torn in his abdomen from the Predator's weapon, and to the Predator's surprise, heals from the injury in seconds. He thanks the Predator, not knowing who or what they are. He asks them if they're afraid, and tells them to take comfort in the fact that they were doomed the moment they decided to come in between him and his desires. Eldon continues his monologue, briefly addressing Francis when he gets impaled by an invisible Predator. The Predators are locked in combat with the Xenomorphs and him. Eldon wishes to meet his guests while also wanting some alone time with his dear friend Francis. Engaged in a fight with the Predators, Eldon mutates his body to form teeth to bite off a Predator's arm to get away. Francis remarks if Eldon wants to learn about humanity, he should die like the rest of the humans. Eldon starts another monologue about what it feels like to be human, to be made by the engineers. He says all of this while being impaled. He then grabs hold of the Predator by their mask and calls them all children, throwing stones at a god. Eldon says that his people, the engineers, created all this. The capacity for war, the urge to kill, the ability to do it. The engineers gave them a conscience to ignore, a mind to devise things to be horrified by, hands to make them real, eyes to watch doom as it approaches them, and a voice to shout out the inevitable. Eldon rips off the mask of the Predator. It manages to drive a dagger through the Xenomorph's head. Eldon shoves his hands inside the Predator's mouth and splits the Predator's head in two. He remarks that all the evolution and growth, just to kill the weak, makes them feel superior. He mocks the Predator and asks him if this is the point of living. Francis manages to get away from the combat, but he's shocked when he sees a part of Eldon taking root and branching, looking green. He mentions to himself that Eldon has taken this form because of the accelerant. Interrupted by his cough, he spits out blood, reminding him of his condition. Eldon, with his fists covered in green blood, calls out to the other Predator. He taunts them by reminding them that they know when they're outmatched. The Predator, in response, cuts a part of the Xenomorph's tail and marks Eldon's head. Eldon says the Predator honors what it doesn't understand. He thinks that's their ritual. Eldon starts another monologue with the Predator. He starts by talking about his past, how he bowed, scraped, and idolized his creators. But unlike the Predator, he was freed. The Predator offers their dagger to Eldon to presumably kill them, but Eldon rejects it. Francis is on the other side, struggling with Eldon's growth over the state of the art technology and can't get anything to work. He gives up, coughs, and says it's time he got Eldon's attention. The Predator, who got bit by Eldon's stomach mutation, is slowly transforming. As evidence, he takes off his mask and discards it, never to be used again, which is something Predators don't usually do. Francis hoped the accelerant could heal him, but he wondered what else it could do. Eldon calls Francis out, asks him to see what he's made, referring to the mutant Predator, and wonders if he should thank Francis for the gift. Francis struggles and falls, but manages to open the first aid kit and find a medicinal respirator to make more time for himself. The mutated Predator has now changed under the influence of the bite. Eldon, still looking for Francis, admits he came on a little too strong, and asks Francis to not draw it out any longer. Eldon offers to bury the hatchet and leave together. Another one of the Predators comes across his mutated kin and tries to speak with them, but is startled by their transformation. A much larger body with boils all over the skin, a mutated mouth with more than the trademark four finger-like protrusions, pitch black eyes, and a third smaller arm growing out of its left shoulder. Eldon finds the dead crewmates in the sick bay and makes remarks about how life is always the same. On the other side, a fight ensues between the mutant predator and the normal one. The predator tries to swipe at them, only for its arm to be ripped off. The mutated one overpowers the predator and bites his forehead, ripping its head off and killing it. Francis struggles with his cough and is trying to fix the rover electronics. Eldon tells him if he's in the Helios, then there's nowhere to run because he has the drive components. Eldon wants to make sure the communicator still works. Francis taunts Eldon and tells him to get to him before his disease does, or before his friends outside do. He rips off the green growth that's growing on his palm. He asks Eldon if he thinks he's alive, whether he feels like he's some kind of god, calling the plant's leaves in his footsteps parasites, proclaiming that he'd rather die than get infected. 
Francis unleashes his modified buggy onto the xenomorphs while they try to attack the vehicle and die. Eldon hears the commotion and follows it. Eldon finds the xenomorphs attacking the empty vehicle and appreciates the carnage in the sick bay. He asks them if they've seen Francis. Francis thinks to himself how his theory about the Black Goose mutation was right and deduces that if he collected it from its source and diluted it, the concoction might just work. As soon as he climbs out of a vent, he's grabbed by a predator and begs for his life. In a turn of events, Eldon is attacked by the Xenomorphs, who fail to recognize or acknowledge him. Another mutant, Eldon is fighting the Xenomorphs, asking them to stop before he does something they'll all regret, reminding them they're not enemies. Francis, held in the Predator's hold, accepts his fate and asks for death. He ends up coughing on the Predator's mask, who then takes it off, scaring Francis. The Predator lets Francis go, who realizes that the Predator has a code of honor. Francis tells the Predator to let Eldon know that he's looking for him. Eldon, meanwhile, is locked into combat with the Xenomorphs and realizes he's still growing, still changing. The Predator watches them fight while being cloaked. Francis finally reaches the infirmary and gets to building a trap immediately. The mutated Predator seems to be done eating the remains of the other Predator and comes across the communicator and hears Francis's message for Eldon. Francis is coughing and spitting blood everywhere, his condition exacerbated by physical stress. He falls to the ground, not before calling all constructs to the Cadmos infirmary. He finishes the message by asking Eldon to come find him. He'll teach Eldon how disposable life truly can be, especially Eldon's life. Francis states that Eldon isn't special and that he's just pretending to be alive. His thoughts are not his own, but just the accelerant's doing, calling him a puppet who can't see his strings. He taunts Eldon to come to the Cadmos Infirmary. Eldon is interrupted mid-fight by a predator's weapon slicing through a xenomorph head clean and lodging itself in his chest. He removes the disc from his chest and uses it to decapitate a xenomorph, while the predator uses a gun to shoot a net and trap another xenomorph. Francis watches the combat on a display still talking to Eldon. He says Eldon is not God. God is what's running through Eldon's veins. Eldon acknowledges the Predator's net and wonders how many things he has yet to see in this world. Eldon reaches the infirmary and wonders why Francis is hiding here and what game he's playing. Eldon calls him foolish to think that he could be tricked. As soon as he says that, he's tackled by three constructs that trap Eldon. Francis approaches him with a look of pity. Eldon asks Francis to stop fighting and says he just wants to help, warning him to stop, but Francis injects the syringe and draws Eldon's black blood. Francis begins to walk away, thanking him when Eldon gets up, tears the net, and warns Francis about the accelerant, saying it's not what he thinks it is and that it'll kill him. Francis explains that Eldon wasn't a test subject. He was a filter, making the accelerant work. Francis looks desperate and says he doesn't care about what happens when the concoction is injected, saying he doesn't have time to care anymore. Eldon reminds Francis that he's human and not a machine like him. The goo made him better, but will essentially give any human a fate worse than death if injected. Francis asks Eldon if he was programmed to be so dramatic and that he was built to lose. Eldon tells Francis doesn't know what's inside the substance, but Francis replies by saying he's excited to find out and injects himself. Francis's eyes turn red and he begins to groan. Eldon begins punching through the metal door between them and tears through it, only to see Francis begin to transform. Eldon states the pain is going to last forever. The waves in the brain, in the arms, legs and chest, the muscles tearing themselves free. He offers to help Francis when he's interrupted by a predator. Eldon asks it to stop, but it slices Eldon's leg off. He kicks the predator's face, realizing Francis was right and he doesn't understand anything. Francis pretended to be his friend, but injected poison in him, and the predator marked Eldon, only to betray him later. Eldon's tackled by the predator, but soon they get knocked by a mutated Francis who runs away. Eldon is thrown to the ground and gets up, his leg regrown. He turns to the predator and says they don't understand each other. He thinks the mark is a sign of belonging, but it's a branding, like that of a cattle. Eldon wants to teach the predator how wrong he was one blow at a time. In another part of the ship, the mutated predator sees Francis running, who's wondering what happened to him. The mutated predator jumps off and attacks an unaware Francis. Friends till the end. Eldon raises his hands and asks the predator to stop, finding it disappointing how similar to humans the predator's his speech is interrupted by the predator's beam weapon, which leaves a hole in all four of Eldon's palms. In another part of the ship, Mutant Francis begins talking to the mutated predator while writhing in pain, asking about the noises in his head. He asks the predator to leave him alone and shoves it away. His transformation seems to be ridding him of his disease, making him feel strong while also giving him a lot of pain. The tumorous growths on his skin vanish for redder skin underneath, making him proclaim that he's cured and left feeling invincible. Eldon is busy in combat with the sole unmutated predator and wants to teach them about war. He gets impaled by the predator's metallic claws mid-conversation. He kicks the predator, 
His speech is interrupted by him dodging a disc thrown by the predator, only to be stabbed by a spear. Eldon uses his smaller arms to pull it out from his back and stabs the predator with it, pinning him to the ground. While doing this, he says he notices everything, including the xenomorphs lurking behind them, and leaves the predator pinned at the mercy of the xenomorphs. The sole survivor of the five predator squad is attacked by the xenomorphs and is presumably dead. Francis, meanwhile, is dealing with the mutated predator. He says that he's clean, no more disease. Fear or death, the mutated behemoth attacks Francis, whose back turns into a big maw with bony teeth and bites off the mutated predator's face. Francis turns around and starts monologuing while fighting the behemoth. He says he understands Eldon now, the simplicity of living, destroying, going through, then going home. Francis feels like everything else is a distraction. He's interrupted by the behemoth, who regains control over the fight, grabs Francis's arms and breaks them in two, exposing the bones underneath. The seemingly dead predator that was left at the mercy of the xenomorphs by Elden is still alive, fighting the xenomorphs. Elden is also attacked by a xenomorph, and he taunts it to finish this fight. While saying so, he releases a clamp from the Garion and begins conversing with the predator while they both fight the xenomorphs. He asks the predator if they're better than the xenomorphs, and wonders if the predator understands him. He asks the predator to let him save it, to have someone to explain, but is interrupted by the predator's shoulder-mounted weapon which evaporates most of the xenomorph's body. Elden says he tried and that's more than what anyone did for him, and runs away from the crumbling ship. He breaks the glass pane and leaps towards the Gerion through the vacuum of space. Francis, now tired, calls the behemoth a bad thing and commands it to stay away. He grunts and tells it to let him heal. Eldon reaches the airlock and cracks it open to let himself in. The behemoth moves and lands a punch on Francis. It grabs him by the neck and throws him down on the ground. Francis begs it to stop. Just then, Eldon finds them fighting. Eldon asks Francis if it hurts. He asks him if he can relate to his pain now. He declares he'll help Francis since he has no one left. Eldon picks a pipe and smacks the behemoth. Francis comes to his senses and decides to get in the fight, helping Eldon. Eldon tells Francis to grab the behemoth's arm, and they force the behemoth to kneel and rip both of its arms off its body. Eldon gives the pipe to Francis as a welcome back present, who uses it to finish off the behemoth. Eldon asks Francis whether the accelerant cured him if he's still hanging in there. Francis replies by saying it's cured him a little. He can feel it breaking down, eaten away by the accelerant. Everything's getting harder, slower. Eldon asks why. Francis says he's an immortal man keeping himself alive, storing himself for another cryosleep. Eldon says he knew all of that, but wonders why fight for life, to stay alive. He says everything in this world hurts, cuts and burns, and asks if this is all there is to life. Francis says everything hurts until it doesn't. Both of them have a conversation about their respective existential dread. Francis's body starts to disintegrate. The cancer he wanted to cure has mutated along with his body. They both realize that Francis has little time left to live. They talk about having no options left to sleep away his death. Eldon takes his friend into the green growth filled cockpit. He watches his only friend wither away while talking to him. Eldon is alone. In his hand, the only remnants of his friend, his fingers. He wonders about a whole life, all the pain, anger, and sadness, watching how it all fits into such a small space. As he places the fingers in a small box to keep as a reminder, Eldon asks if he's truly alive, and he begs the lurking xenomorphs to not leave. He thinks of where he could go. He doesn't have to decide right away, knowing that now he has forever to decide what he'll be doing during this forever. He stares into the void with the box in his hand, with all the time in the world and no friends left. Predator, Fire and Stone, Golgo, and the Predator. With a crack and whistle, a cryotube opens inside Percy's to reveal Higgins' face, a screen showing cryo defrost initiated, proving the same. Golgo slaps Higgins across the face to wake him up. January 23rd, 2319. 2.54 a.m. Earth Central Time, Theta-2 Reticuli System. Piper is already up and ready. Golgo starts explaining their situation. He tells them about Eldon and Francis, the engineer and everything that's happened. Golgo looks at the ship's systems, spots a stowaway, and points it out to the men. Higgins and Piper wonder what it could be, and Golgo shows his uneasiness and tells them it could be anything after all that's happened. Piper picks up a gun, but is told to use an electric baton instead. The men ready themselves, with electric batons in their hands, with Golgo holstering the engineer gun. They're scanned by the stowaway, lurking in the dark. The men move out, and Golgo gives them instructions. Piper is told to go where the signal first flared, so they can go around and flank the stowaway. Piper, confident in himself, asks the others to stay back and let him handle the beast like a man. The men split up to search, and Golgo forges a conversation about the SKP on Fury 116. Higgins shuts him off quickly by saying he'd have left him there with the prisoners if Galgo hadn't been such a runt back then. The conversation is abruptly ended by a beeping noise, showing the stowaway below Piper, who's in combat with the stowaway. When the men ask Piper what it is, Piper says, he can smell it 
When his arm gets slashed and he tells the men that it's not a beast, Golgo immediately knows what it could be, saying he blasted one of them before he ditched Francis. Piper tells the men he's not one to back down from a fight and confronts the stowaway. The stowaway aims its beam weapon at Piper's chest and obliterates him. The men figure their mate is dead by now and start figuring out how to deal with the predator. Higgins is visibly furious and asks Golgo to fess up. Golgo has a plan in mind. He leads the old man into the airlock and locks him out. Higgins calls him a bastard and Golgo tells him what he was told by Higgins. Sometimes, a hunter's best friend is bait. Higgins proclaims it's not over between them. Soon they both find out their guest is in the same room as Higgins. The bait worked. Higgins speaks loudly to the cloak predator, calling Piper a blowhard and stating the predator is against a pro now. Golgo uses his wrist-mounted device and opens the outside airlock. The void of space engulfs all the air, and Higgins along with it. Golgo is proud of Higgins' sacrifice and thinks the monsters ought to think thrice before sneaking in on his ship. He closes the cargo bay doors, and as soon as he's done rationalizing his actions, his wrist device beeps and shows the predator above him, still in the room with him. The predator uncloaks and reveals their terrifying face to a shocked Golgo. Golgo talks to him and taunts the predator, saying he's banged up some of their kind before. They get into melee combat, and Golgo uses his engineer gun and manages to pry off the predator's mouth to reveal a terrifying scarred face across his forehead, the reason for its missing right eye. The Predator uses their net trap contraption and ensnares Golgo. They pick him up and start moving him, while Golgo still threatens him. The Predator pulls out their wrist-mounted claws and shuts up Golgo. To his surprise, the Predator cuts him loose and shoves him away. Golgo knows why, soon enough. The Predator is drawn to the engineer gun and responds to a screaming Golgo by showing him a projection of the engineer. Golgo figures out soon enough what his stowaway wants from him. Back to where it began. 2107, day four of the hunt. The Predator is on the hunt for the two four-armed sentient creatures. They ambush the two aliens, uncloak, and start fighting. The Predator dodges away from an attack and pulls out their claws to rip through the alien's neck. It holds its neck in vain, trying to stop the bleeding, but dies. The other alien tackles the Predator from their back and shoves a blade through the Predator's mask into their right eye. The Predator is thrown to the ground, but not before they cut off one of the alien's arms. The Predator concludes the hunt by ripping off the alien's spine. They come across a cave painting, depicting a group of four-armed aliens worshipping beings from the stars. The Predator says something, points their beam weapon, and destroys the glyph. 200 years later on the Zeta II reticuli system, the Predator says something unintelligible to their tied-up prisoner Galgo. Galgo says this isn't the worst thing to happen to him. All the intimidation tactics won't work because he's got it all figured out. Galgo knows the Predator wants to hunt for bigger fish, the engineers, specifically the one nearest to them. The Predator doesn't know how to control the ship, so they're keeping Galgo alive to point them in the right direction and make them go back. Galgo screams at the Predator and tells them there's no way in hell he's taking them back to LV-223. The Predator brandishes their claws and brings it to Galgo's face, who, terrified for his life, asks to talk it through and make a deal. Golgo's cut loose by the Predator and thinks he's being helped up, but the Predator picks him up and throws him onto the seat. Golgo takes the controls in his hand and they speed towards LV-223. In a few hours, they arrive and land, while Golgo says this is far as he wants to go. The Predator has something else in mind. Golgo protests in vain as the Predator pushes him to move out of the ship and along with him. The Predator cuffs his hand to them. They head into the jungle and Golgo thinks about the blue giant they're looking for. It was the craziest thing until Golgo saw the Xenomorphs. He tells the Predator the last time he was here, the place was a cesspool of monsters hungry for blood. He asks for his gun back, thinking of the swarm of Xenomorphs, the same swarm now visible to them in a neat pile of death stacked across the cliff. He wonders if the big blue alien did this by itself. The Predator is in for quite a fight. The Predator squats down to examine the black goo coalesced into a puddle near the pile. Golgo notices it in time and yanks at their plasma restraints and warns them not to touch it. They're both interrupted by two huge six-legged beasts fighting each other, who turn and find new prey to fight. One of the beasts heads straight for them, and Golgo calls the Predator crazy for not turning away from the fight. The Predator leaps over the creature's head and impales it with their spear, while Golgo begs to be unchained and be given a weapon to defend himself. In a few moments, he understands the Predator's plan. It was to wrap the plasma tether around the creature's neck. They both tug on it with force and decapitate the creature not soon after. The severed head flies off, and Galgo wishes he'd never come back to this wretched planet. He's interrupted by someone mid-speech. The perfect bait. Wolf 
424 system. Golgo is running off somewhere, despite Angela telling him they've got the surviving crew, stating he's got to check on something. Angela says that the ship's core is melting down and she's leaving him in 60 seconds. Galgo thinks of the vacation he would have back home if he found a cash dock in the captain's cabin, only to find no cash but crew members hidden behind the door he just blasted open. He leads them back to the Garion, and they make their escape from their soon-to-explode ship. Angela's glad to always have him around to save their asses. Back on LV-223, the Predator leaps at Angela, but is yanked by the plasma tether pulled by Galgo in the opposite direction. Galgo commands Angela to run, and they witness the Predator and Galgo in a screaming match. Angela tells her crewmates to go, in light of the vow she made to let no one else die. The Predator grabs Galgo's neck, but loosens their hold and comes to an understanding with the humans around them. Galgo turns to Angela and speaks to her, only to be punched in the face. Angela is furious at him for leaving them stranded. Galgo says they can be all friends here. Angela wonders if this was a rescue operation until she finds out the story on their way back to the camp. The Predator and Galgo still plasma cuffed to each other. Angela wants to take the Perseus and leave and never look back. She's angry when Galgo tells her the reason he's here with the Predator, and the Predator has eyes for the engineer on LV-223. Angela tells them she's seen the big blue one and that it's a clean-up operation. The engineer has been killing all the black goo monsters and xenomorphs, ripping them apart and studying them. Golgo's told that the cave is safe from xenomorphs for some reason. The Predator soon lights a fire with his beam weapon, and it's a campfire between Galgo and the Predator. They share a moment, where Galgo shows his scars and is talking about them, and the Predator in turn shows theirs and hollow projects the ones who gave it to them. Galgo is woken up by a kick on his forehead by Angela who says he had enough beauty sleep and his hunting partner is ready to head out. The plasma-tethered pair head into the woods, led by Angela, who points out where she last saw the engineer. Galgo sees her turning back and asks her if she's not coming with them, to which she tells him they're done. She heads back, not before saying goodbye to Galgo. Galgo's got a plan. If they want to draw out the engineer, they need bait. They soon come across two beasts locked in intense combat. Galgo starts talking about his plan, only to be interrupted by the Predator's plan. The Predator covers Galgo's mouth to not make noise and entraps one of the beasts with their weapon. Galgo asks a question and is again interrupted by the beast this time. The Predator is thrown afar, their spear on the ground. The other beast sprints toward the Predator, who roars back. Galgo tells the Predator to stay down while he picks up the spear and impales the beast's head, saving the Predator's life. The Predator pulls out the engineer gun, scaring Galgo to death, offering it to him as a token of gratitude. The Predator scans another beast in the vicinity and immediately sprints toward it, making Galgo realize they were the bait for the engineer all along. Ahab, around 2107, day 4 of the hunt, UE-753, Chaos Borealis system. The Predator comes across a depiction of the gods they wish to hunt, roughly 2152, day 3 of the hunt, UE-992, Chi, Herculis system. The Predator sees a statue of the gods they wish to hunt, sometime near 2195, day 7 of the hunt, LV-9982, Beta Hydri system. The Predator destroyed their prey and came across a hologram of the god they wished to hunt, January 22nd, 2219, day one of the hunt. Zeta-2, Reticuli system. The Predator witnesses Galgo shoot a strange weapon and kill one of their kind. January 23rd, 2219. Day 2 of the hunt. Zeta-2, Reticuli system. The Predator shows Galgo the hologram of the guard they wish to hunt. January 31st, 2219. 8.13 p.m. ECT. LV-223. The Engineer and the Predator in melee combat. The Engineer grabs hold of the hair-like braids of the Predator, and the Predator lands a hefty punch on the god he wishes to hunt. The Predator and the Engineer deal a few blows to each other, and the Predator uses his shoulder-mounted beam weapon point-blank, blasting the Engineer away from them. Galgo points to the plasma tether, and it's clear to the Predator they need all the help they can get. They release the link, and Galgo turns, aiming the Engineer's weapon at it, taking a shot. The Engineer emerges nearly unscathed, and lunges toward the Predator. Galgo turns around and makes a run for it. The Predator turns and shouts something unintelligible to the scurrying Galgo. The Predator gets tackled by the big blue alien, but they unholster their wrist claws and slash the Engineer's face, making him scream in pain. Galgo keeps running, justifying his actions to himself. Meanwhile, the Engineer grabs a hold of the Predator's neck and throws them several feet away, their fall broken by the ship nearby. The Engineer shoves aside the clearing and sprints toward the Predator, who's noticeably out of their senses from the impact. The Predator screams in pain as they get their arm almost snapped off by the blue giant. 
The Big Blue also injures one of the Predator's legs and watches them slowly limp up the landing ramp of the ship. The Predator put on their mask and cloak themselves. The engineer enters the ship and is greeted by multiple forced projectiles. He reflexively puts his arm out and blocks the sharp projectiles with their flesh. Immediately after, the Predator closes the gap and launches their spear weapon, which goes through the engineer. The momentum of the spear carrying the Blue Giant and embedding itself at the nearest wall. The Blue Giant and the Predator exchange some words in languages beyond human comprehension. The Predator now writhing in pain from their injuries. The engineer pulls out the spear in the opposite direction and the Predator accepts their fate. Just when the Blue Giant gets shot by none other than Galgo with the engineer's own gun, he came back. After all, Galgo helps him up and they both know what the beeping sound near the dying engineer is. They make their way out of the ship safely. The engineer reaches for the beeping device but accepts its fate, saying a final word. Galgo wonders how big the explosion would be and asks the Predator. Moments later, Thankfully, quite far from the ship now, Galgo sheds a tear for his beautiful baby and contemplates their situation. They're stranded now, with no ship to whisk them away from the dreadful planet. The Predator makes their way toward the now-destroyed ship's remains, and as soon as Galgo asks them where they're headed, he sees Angela. Angela and her crew of two others make their way to witness the aftermath of the fight. Angela points out the loss of their only means of escape from the planet. Galgo admits he messed up, that he was running away again. He justifies his action by saying he figured if the engineer survived, it'd be only a matter of time before it found him, her and others, and Galgo couldn't let that happen. Galgo now sees what the Predator was up to as he calls them and sees the Predator scream in pride over its dead adversary's remains with his skull and spine in their hand. Galgo says he's beginning to like the guy and tells a worried Angela they're too minor league for the Predator. They watch the Predator part ways as they enter the clearing and vanish without a word spoken. February 12th, 2219. 7.16 p.m. ECT LV-223. Stay back, Galgo says as he kills a xenomorph with his engineer gun. Angela and Galgo talk about their plan next. Galgo mentions Russell's notebook, the gibberish about some signal in the mountain. Angela tells him survival is the most important thing and snarks at him, saying not everyone has a guardian angel. Galgo remembers the Predator and tells her he's no use to them and they've parted ways now. Angela names the Predator Ahab and Galgo tells her Ahab has been keeping himself. Prometheus, Fire and Stone, Omega, all for one. April 9th, 2219, LV-223, Salvage Mission, Project Prometheus, Survivor's Log, We're Starving. Scavenged supplies are exhausted, and due to the accelerated evolutionary nature of this planet, the produce that sustained the Hadley's Hope survivors has evolved beyond palpability. We're living on grasses, insects, and bitter greens. Jill's sick. We need meat. Angela stands still, her arms drawn out as she aims her bow and draws the arrow, ready to release it. Golgo asks her to take the shot, or he'll use his engineer gun to zap the strange animal. Angela wants him to conserve the weapon's ammunition since they don't understand how it works and it might have a better use. Golgo loses his patience and takes a shot, but misses his target. The startled animal runs towards them and attacks Angela. Golgo falls to the ground and loses his gun. Angela wrestles with one of the animals and blocks them with her arm. Her arm bleeds, but she drives a makeshift blade through the animal. Galgo gets up and seems to have killed the other animal just in time to save her, although it wasn't him who managed to save her. It was the predator they named Ahab. They couldn't decipher the predator's language well enough to even know if they had names. Ahab suits them well enough, the crew said. They hadn't spotted Ahab in months and assumed they were dead. Angela says Ahab left them a few weapons brandished from the bones of the native creatures as gifts or offerings. Angela isn't sure. She compares her lack of understanding of the predator's motives to her lack of communication with her human crew. They get meat for Jill and tell her it's Galgo's leg. Tough, but surprisingly delicious. Galgo tells them it's not funny. Angela comes to tell them about the meat, but she spots something moving in the overcast sky and calls Galgo and Chris over. It's the Helios. Eldon's coming back, coming back to finish them off, Angela says. Galgo says they need that ship. They follow the path of the speeding ship and approach the crash site. The ship is engulfed in fire, and in response, Angela grabs dirt to extinguish it. Galgo tells her it's not a campfire and it's impossible to put the fire out with handfuls of dirt. Angela argues with Galgo and says there could be food on board, and they should check for survivors. Right as she stops her words, they see a large six-limbed alien walk out of the wreckage. It was Eldon. They wonder if it was just the crash or the accelerant that left him so broken. Galgo wants to go for his gun, but Angela tells him not to. Angela thinks it's killing Eldon. She thinks whatever Eldon has become has happened because she brought him here. She feels responsible since he's here on her orders. Galgo thinks otherwise and tells Angela it's idiotic to treat a construct like a real person. 
Angela moves towards Eldon, thinking she owes him a hand to hold while he's dying. The night passes and Angela wakes up to Eldon, introducing himself with a xenomorph body in hand. Angela, startled, asks Eldon if he's alive. She didn't think he'd make it. Francis told them Eldon was dosed with the accelerant. Eldon says he's alive, more alive than he was when they last spoke together. Eldon talks about the creation of Adam, the spark of life, and asks Angela if she thinks he has a soul. Eldon is trying to salvage parts to make an amplifier and a bullhorn. Angela points out the futility of the plan as they're nearly two dozen light years away from the nearest transport route, and nobody would hear the signal. Eldon hopes a god or priest would. Angela tells him it's better to stay alive long enough to be categorized as missing since its policy. She's interrupted by a grim Eldon, who says that would take years and wonders how long he has left to live. Angela says if the bullhorn worked, they still need a signal to amplify. They head back to the cave and look through the professor's notes. It says there's a beacon inside the mountain. Human in origin, something that crashed here predating the escape pod, or Angela reads the name Wayland and realizes it's the Prometheus. Golgo gets up and asks her how many people she's getting killed this time in the search of her ghost ship. She calls it unfair, since she didn't know, to which Galgo replies by saying the crew wasn't told the reason for the mission in the first place. The other two talk about the alternative and say they would stay, even if it took more than two years, even if the likelihood of a rescue mission for a salvage crew on an off-the-books mission is next to impossible. Angela says leaving them isn't a good idea, to which Jill replies by asking for the gun. Galgo snaps back immediately and points out the dangers they could get into without the gun in hand. Angela says they have Eldon. Galgo calls Eldon an AI. Forklift turns psychopath and says he can't be given the gun. Angela has an idea, Galgo says, as they hide near the clearing waiting. Angela says he's the damsel in distress, and Ahab will show up to protect him, so he's the bait. She says he can go and get Eldon if he wants, to which Galgo says he'd rather trust a bug. Galgo heads toward the building, and is immediately greeted by xenomorphs, and in a few moments, Eldon. Galgo points out that the mama is angry, and tells Angela they should go before she comes out. Angela can't leave him since he saved Galgo's life. Galgo says he can, since Eldon is just a robot, and says he'll name a hard drive after him if they ever get off the planet. Angela picks up a rock, and Galgo starts arguing with her about her plan. Ahab appears out of nowhere and leaps over them slicing through the xenomorphs with his blade, and joins the fight with Eldon. They manage to kill the horde, but Eldon gets bit and is slowly healing from his wounds. Eldon says he's not ready to die. Angela tells the big guy to stay with her, as she's not ready to let him die either. Golgo asks Angela to move as Ahab shoves her away from Eldon and grabs Eldon by the face. Angela tries to hold back Ahab, but fails to do anything about it. Thankfully, Ahab has different intentions. Eldon realizes Ahab doesn't want to hurt him. They're just looking at the mark on his forehead. It seems to be a sign of kin and their brothers. Ahab and Eldon hold heads as a sign of kin. Galgo is seemingly angry since Eldon earned it while attacking his ship. Eldon replies by saying he's evolving. Before Galgo can say anything, Angela asks him to come to her. They find the Xenomorph Queen's body, which seems too big to be able to leave. Seems like she's been in there long enough to grow that big and now is stuck. They find a control panel, and Galgo makes a bet, which he loses as Angela activates the systems quickly. They take the vehicle, with Eldon and Ahab in tow. They make small talk as they travel, and Galgo asks how much further. Angela asks if he needs a potty break and Galgo snaps at Eldon, saying he needs him to stop breathing down his neck. Eldon says he can smell his guilt, his lies. He tells Galgo how fear has a smell, and so does deceit and deception. Galgo retorts by saying Eldon isn't even a human, for which Eldon grows more delighted with each passing day. Ahab laughs at the commotion, which pisses Galgo off even more. Angela asks them to knock it off, since they've reached the mountain. The drill goes off, and they start digging through. Soon, they hit something hard on their way through, and after Angela asks, Golgo heads there to check what happened. Golgo says they have a problem in the back. Eldon states it will eat through the floor in short order, and maybe they should have drained her blood before setting out. Angela spots a blood bug and ducks just in time to save herself from the shattered glass window. They soon find out it's not a blood bug, it's a vein they've hit, the vein carrying all that blood. Eldon tells them that the mountain is alive. Galgo wonders that if they don't get squeezed to death by the living mountain, they'll be digested by its blood. Angela finds a landing and takes the chance immediately. The vehicle grinds through a smaller tunnelway and comes to a halt, suffering a few bumps in the process. They get out of the vehicle, looking at the surroundings and the crashed vehicle. Angela pulls out her device and finds the source of the signal, Wayland. Angela says she wants to pry bony sharp bits off the wall so that she can use them to dig through the fleshier parts. Eldon says no, telling them that it's a being. It must have been on Wayland's ship, and now it's grown around it. The accelerant evolved too fast, like the queen inside the Onega. They're both a prisoner of their flesh. The flesh wall starts growing sharp protrusions. 
and Galgo points out the flesh is closing in on them. Angela says the only way of getting out is to find the remains of Waylon's ship. She tells Eldon that he would have to kill her to stop her. Eldon says he doesn't want to do that. Galgo calls Eldon out and asks how he could be a pacifist now when he ripped off the wings of 15 bugs not so long ago. That was different. Eldon said. Galgo asks about the attack on his ship to get to Francis. Eldon, now seemingly communing with the being, says that the incident was the same. Eldon sought out Francis as they sought Wayland, as he sought out his god. We crave meaning and thirst for understanding. In our arrogance, we believe we were made for some higher purpose, that the knowledge of that purpose will free us, and if our gods will not give it, then we'll steal it, so we may become gods ourselves. Eldon's monologue while he's assimilating himself with the being ends with Angela saying, because they could, the walls closing in. Angela tells Eldon that she's not ready to die. Eldon says he's not ready to let her. He tells them to hurry. He'd hold it open as long as he could. Angela thanks Eldon. Ahab struggles during the climb, but Galgo grabs his arm and all three make it out of the tunnel. They made it. Ahab collapses into a loud laugh. Galgo wonders for all that they've lost. What did they get? Angela says, we're all alive. That's all we get. That's all any of us gets. Marvelous verdict. This marks the end of the AVP Fire and Stone saga, a total of 17 issues and a journey across centuries, bringing about nasty betrayals, existential crisis, gore, and a lot of death. The comics might seem a little stretched out in some parts, but it adds to the overall theme of the battle. Existentialism seems to be an ongoing thought throughout the issues. By the end of the series, one thing is for sure. The humans, Eldon and Ahab, may not be as different after all.